and I try to give you a sense of it with uh, a very uh, simple back of the envelope calculation. But now uh, there are the details, and the details are much, much more complicated. So I will just review what are the main issues about describing this process. So uh, what are the main issues between uh, what, what are the main issues about understanding what is the mass of the final outcome? Of a supernova. So, uh, understanding what is the final outcome of a supernova, whether there is a supernova or not, and what is the final mass of the black hole, is a really complicated thing because of uh, several things. First of all, the most reasonable way to uh, think about it is to uh, kind of expect that the mass of the remnant depends on the compactness of the inner layer of the star. What does it mean? Again, let's see our onion-like structure of the star. In the very center you have the iron core and then some uh, silicon burning shells and so on and so on. A reasonable idea is that if the uh, central region is particularly compact, then it will be more difficult for the supernova to unbind the outer layer. Uh, and in particular, this has been, um, let's say, uh, proposed and analyzed by Freire and collaborators, and leads to the idea that if we look at the mass of the carbon-oxygen core, so basically the central part of the star up to this red part, if we look at the mass of the carbon-oxygen core, we can get a good prediction of what will be the final fate of the star. Basically, they suggested that this is a, if the mass of the carbon-oxygen core is larger than eight solar masses, then the supernova fails. But this is a very simple approximation. So the idea is if I have enough mass confining a sufficiently small radius inside my star, then it will be more difficult for the shock to be revived. Um, this is still adopted by many people, but uh, O'Connor and Mott in 2011 proposed a more, um, I would say, physically motivated statement. So uh, they proposed to use to understand whether a star will undergo a supernova and will explode, leaving a neutron star, or whether it will collapse to a black hole, to use the Xi parameter, called the compactness. Xi is the file like this, so is uh, a mass that you can basically arbitrarily choose, divided by the radius that encloses this mass. So how do you uh, choose this mass? Well, basically you want to measure this compactness, so m over r, in a sufficiently small portion of the star at the onset of collapse. So people, most people take 2.5 solar masses, which means that they are, you are well inside the carbon-oxygen core, basically at the iron core. And uh, this parameter measures again uh, how small is the radius that encloses 2.5 solar masses when the star is at the onset of core collapse. And then uh, O'Connor and Ott did uh, hydrodynamical simulations of supernovae, core collapse supernovae in one dimension, and they found uh, dependencies of several properties of the star and of the collapse on the Xi parameter. For example, they found this relation. This plot shows the time that is needed for the star to collapse into a black hole as a function of the compactness parameter Xi. And clearly, if uh, the time for collapse to a black hole is infinite, it means uh, that the collapse will never happen, so that the supernova will succeed and that the neutron star will form. And if, if this time instead is very short, it means that the collapse will happen very fast and that there is probably not even a supernova. These points show different models that O'Connor and Ott uh, studied. And you see that there is a clear trend of the time for the system to collapse to a black hole as a function of the compactness C. In particular, at about 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 
there is a, a very quick change in the slope of this. Based on this result, uh, O'Connor and Ott proposed to use not a carbon oxygen core, but this compactness Xi parameter uh, as a uh, reference value to decide whether a supernova will occur and then we will be left with a neutral star or the star will collapse directly to a black hole. And in particular, uh, um, based on several uh, astrophysical arguments, we can say that C larger than 0 0.2 is uh, a reasonable threshold, although empirical threshold, to expect the formation of a black hole by direct collapse. Then let me briefly mention that uh, a uh, recent work by Limongi has shown that indeed the compactness has a strong correlation with the carbon oxygen core mass. So this plot shows the compactness as a function of the carbon oxygen core mass for some massive star models. Uh, basically the colors of these points uh, indicate different velocities of the project, rotation velocities, spin velocities of the projector star, but it does not matter. What matters is that there is some quite strong correlation between Xi and the carbon oxygen core mass. So in the end, it may be that even the carbon oxygen core mass is not that bad to predict whether a star will end up as a black hole or as a star. But this is still a work in progress, so uh, would be a good news if the carbon oxygen core is not. And finally, let me briefly mention that there are even more complicated models. So, uh, Earth and collaborators propose that the compactness is not good enough to predict the final fate of a neutron star, of a supernova, sorry. And they suggest that a good model will rely on two parameters. M4, which is the enclosed mass, and MU4, which is the mass gradient at a dimensionless entropy per nucleon S equal to 4. I will not discuss it. If you have uh, any uh, questions about it, we can talk about it later. Otherwise, I will not finish my lecture. But let me say that this idea to use these two parameters is based on the fact that, that the uh, mass accretion from the outer layers of the outer portion of the stars is proportional to mu, somehow, to the mass gradient, while the energy that can be uh, irradiated by neutrinos is proposed to the uh, m4 times mu4. So basically, m4 times mu4 measures how efficient are neutrinos in uh, producing the supernova, while the MU4 uh, is a measure of uh, how uh, heavy are the outer layers of the star and uh, how uh, much efficiency they have in quenching the supernova. So you have seen many, many different models for core collapse supernovae. Let me say that one of the main results of the more sophisticated models, like the two-parameter models, is this one. So uh, this plot shows uh, the initial mass of a star from 10 to 50 solar masses. Uh, on the y-axis you see the M4 parameter, and this histogram measures the value of the M4 parameter for each of these initial stellar masses. You see that there are some white histograms and some black histograms. Black histograms are models that, according to this model of collapse, do not undergo any supernova. So the black, histogram, the black histograms are the models that collapse directly into a black hole, while the white histograms are models that undergo a supernova. And so the bottom line of these models is that uh, you cannot say from 8 to 25 solar masses I'm going to have a supernova and then to have a, new, a neutral star left, while for larger masses I'm going to have a black hole. According to this model, there will be some direct collapse and then some black holes forming also at smaller masses and some explosions, so some neutron stars forming even at large masses. 
That is why these models are usually referred to as island of uh, core collapse supernovae or islands of dire collapse. So this was a very fast overview and I would say not really detailed overview of all the core collapse supernova models that we are considering in the last few years. Uh, the bottom line of this, uh, the, what, the thing I would like you to take home from this is that our knowledge of core collapse supernova is very poor. And there are many models, all of them with their, with their predictions, all of them with their uncertainties or shortcuts. The bottom line is that in all of these models, there is a strong connection with the final mass and with the final properties of the progenitor star. If the progenitor star is very, very massive, let's say above 30 something solar masses, it is extremely unlikely that the core collapse supernova succeed. So it is extremely likely that the black hole will form from direct collapse. While at lower masses, it is more likely that you have an explosion. Although the details are still quite uncertain. And in addition to that, we don't know really how fast it is the shock. So this plot here shows what is the dependence of the energy explosion of the supernova as a function of time for different models. You see that if the shock is revived very early, then the available energy is larger than if the shock is launched with a delay. So this is also very important when we uh, include these models into models of uh, black hole and neutron star formation. Then it is very uncertain uh, what is the fallback. Basically, the, what, is, uh, what is the minimum of fallback? Um, during a supernova, you may be able to eject all the outer layers or some of them can fall back onto the proton neutron star and accrete very fast on the proton neutron star. So this is the general idea. But uh, it is very unclear what is the amount of fallback that can be uh, can accrete onto the proton neutron star because it depends on the explosion energy, which is unsure, as we have seen in the previous slides. It depends on the angular momentum transfer inside uh, the center part of the star. It depends on the projector mass and metallicity. So I would like just to show you this plot that was published by Heger in 2003, and I don't think that it's much better than this. So this shows again on the x-axis the initial mass of the star, on the y-axis the metallicity of the star, and here you have different regions. The green region shows uh, formation of a neutron star, so the supernova is completely successful. The black region shows the direct collapse to a black hole, so no supernova at all. The red region shows when we can still form a black hole by fallback. So when you have the formation of a proton neutron star, but that material is accreting onto the black hole. And from the fact that there is no number on this y-axis, you can understand that this is tremendously uncertain. So we can barely understand what is going on as a function of the initial mass of the star. We think it depends on the metallicity, but models cannot predict exactly uh, the modulation of this process with metallicity. And to make things even more complicated, there are also other flavors of supernova, not just for collapse supernova, that can affect the formation of black holes. Uh, before I mention electron capture supernova, we will not have time here to talk about electron capture supernova, but at least let me mention the pair instability supernova because this is essential to understand whatever plot, whatever model of black hole mass that you can find in the literature. So, uh, what is pair instability supernova? 
The idea is that if you have a star that is very, very massive, uh, its helium core can grow above about 64 solar masses. What, why is 64 solar masses so interesting? Because above this value, the central temperature rises above the about 7 times 10 to the 8 Kelvin, and above this temperature, the uh, emission from the star can lead to efficient production, the nuclear reaction from the star can lead to an efficient production of gamma ray radiations, electron positron uh, couples can form in the core of a star efficient. This means that uh, we have some pressure from gamma ray photons that is uh, lost because gamma ray photons can produce positron electron couples. And this uh, pressure that is lost with this mechanism leads to an imbalance in the equilibrium of the core. So you have uh, some photons, gamma ray photons, that are efficiently produced, but then they uh, become something else. They become electron positron pairs. And then we don't have the radiation pressure produced by these photons anymore, which means that the gravity cannot be balanced in the internal parts of the star. And this leads to what? This leads to a sudden collapse of the star even before the iron core is formed. This process happens well before the iron core is produced, when we are still during the oxygen burning. So during this collapse, the central parts of the star, of course, reach much, much higher temperature than that which means that all remaining species, not only oxygen, but silicon, neon, and so on, ignite basically instantaneously. This ignition of all the nuclear species produces an explosion, which is dramatic because it leaves no remnant. So a pair instability supernova is a kind of a supernova that is driven by the production of pairs, electron-positron pairs, and that is completely disruptive. It, it leads to the complete disruption of the star, leaving no remnant. This sounds quite complicated to follow this, and of course I didn't put any number inside this because it would require an entire course of nuclear astrophysics. But the bottom line is, while a core collapse supernova is expected to leave a remnant, the pair instability supernova is, not ex is expected to leave no remnant. It happens only for very massive stars with a helium core larger than 64 solar masses. And I would add a very important thing. Unlike the core collapse supernova, the pair instability supernova is a well-known physical mechanism. So when I tried to describe the core collapse supernova, the word that I think I used most was uncertain. This is uncertain, this is unknown, this we are studying, there are alternative things. For the peristability supernova, no. The basics, physics of the peristability supernova is well known. You can find it in these papers. Which is a good thing, because it means that at least from this point of view, we can, we can get some uh, solid result. And then there is also an, uh, let's say, smaller version. Yeah, I think I will do this slide and then we can stop and, and have some coffee. Right? Is that the time for the break? Or I was... It's not too much. Too. Yeah. So even too much, right? No. 135. Uh, I, no, Just it's three, the break. Three. Okay. Just no, 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 I don't remember. The break is 2.30 or 3? It's, I don't have it's any 3 and 3. Yeah, 3. 3, okay. No, then it will be, be even yeah. better if it is 3. So yeah. I don't have to rush into it. Thank yeah, it should be. I, it's 90 minutes per lecture. Hmm? You have 90 minutes for this. Session. Oh, great. Okay. And plenty of time to, to reach the first part. Okay, so um, there is also a... Um, say small version of the pair instability supernova, which is called pulsational pair instability supernova. We will see in a few minutes why this is possibly crucial for LIGO-Virgo objects. The idea is that 
Uh, okay, if we have a star with a helium core mass that reaches the 60-something solar mass threshold, the star is done. It's gonna completely uh, explode, leaving no remnant. But what happens if the helium core mass is massive but not so massive? Let's say between 32 solar masses and 64 solar masses. I took these uh, numbers from this paper, which is like 2017. Well, uh, if the uh, helium core mass is above 30 solar masses, I will have anyway some production of gamma ray photons, which can lead to the formation of pairs, electron pulse from pairs, through this mechanism. This is not as efficient as in the case of, of peri-instability supernovae. So in the case of peri-instability supernovae, the production of pairs completely leaves the core out of balance. While in this case, our slightly less massive core, the missing pressure due to the missing gamma ray photons produces a contraction during oxygen burning. This contraction enhances the temperature, so we have an enhancement of nuclear reactions, which restore pressure. But again, the enhancement of nuclear reaction just restores pressures inside the star without triggering a, a disruptive explosion. What happens is that the star is able to gain equilibrium again after one or more oscillations. So we have that the production of pairs leads the core to contract, the contraction rises the temperature, the temperature starts more nuclear reactions, this allows the star to gain again equilibrium and then the star expands again and then it may still, it may become stable after just one oscillation or it may have again the same problem for the emission of uh, uh, electron positron pair and then it contrasts again and then it expands again. So it may, may undergo a set of uh, oscillations, one or more oscillations after which it gains equilibrium again. But what happens during these oscillations? These oscillations are not a disruptive explosion, but they lead to an enha enhancement of mass loss. So the star will lose mass not only by stellar winds, but also by these uh, pulsational peristability oscillations, which means that again, the final mass of the star before it dies by core collapse supernova will be uh, lower. So, uh, here we are after this overview of core collapse supernova and pulsational experience supernova and peristability supernova and I think at, some, at this point you may be quite confused because there was too much physics in there and then what? What happens to our black holes? What is the mass of the black hole? Can we say something or just nothing? Well, we can try to give a rule of thumb, but be careful. Core collapse supernova is really a difficult matter and stellar astrophysics is really a complicated matter. So the rule of thumb I'm just going to describe now is uh, kind of a simplification of the problem. The problem is pretty hard to solve and still pretty complicated. There are many, many issues to solve. But as a general idea, let's try to give some, some concepts that, are, uh, that do not depend on the model of core collapse supernova that you adopt, that do not depend on the specific model of stellar evolution that you adopt. So the idea is, if a star is massive, but has low metallicity, so is massive means that it's probably going to produce a black hole or at least a neutron star. But its metallicity is small, let's say less than half the solar metals. This star will not lose much mass during its life because of stellar winds. <coughs> a few slides ago, at the beginning of the lecture, we have seen that if the star is metal poor, uh, mass loss is not efficient. 
So this star will have a larger pre-supernova mass. It will approach the end of its life with a larger mass. Then, if this star has a larger mass, above about 30, 40 solar masses at the end of its life, it will be more likely that the supernova, the core collapse supernova, fails. And if the core collapse supernova fails, it is more likely that the star collapses directly to a black hole. So if we have a metal poor star, where stellar winds are less important, this star will have a larger pre-supernova mass than a metal-rich star with the same mass. And then it will be more likely for this star to avoid a supernova and then it will collapse to a black hole. And this black hole, since it forms not from an explosion, not from a supernova, but from a direct collapse, so to a quiet collapse, it will be more massive than uh, the average. So this is the very simplified version of it. The details are very, very complicated and they depend dramatically on which core collapse supernova model you trust, on which evolutionary scenario for your stars you, you accept, but the bottom line is this. If the star is massive and metal poor, then it is kind of efficient in avoiding the supernova and direct collapse into a black hole, and the black hole will be more massive. This idea was first uh, uh, made very clear by Hager and collaborators in 2003. Uh, this is a very important paper to read if you are interested in this stuff. And in particular, there are two very famous plots from this paper. I'm not going to discuss these two plots now because they are pretty complex. You see many, many small labels. I think you are not able to read these labels. So I'm going to describe my simplified version of this plot. So this is the astrophysics. These are the real plots. These are just my cartoon with the essential physics. OK. And these two plots represent the final mass of the star and the compact object as a function of the initial mass of the star, Zan's mass of the star. In this panel, we see it for solar metallicity. Solar metallicity means high, very high metallicity. And here you see it for a zero metallicity. Stars with zero metallicity are the very first stars in the universe. Why zero metallicity? Because zero metallicity is easy to model. There are no metals, so it's easy to model. And in both plots, you see a black line. The black line is uh, the line where uh, the final mass is the same as the initial mass. So it has no physical meaning. It's just uh, uh, to give you an idea of when the final mass is the same as the initial mass. The blue line, instead, is the actual final mass of the star. So the mass of the star uh, before the supernova. And the red line is the mass of the compact object. So let's see what happens. First, let's see what happens at solar metallicity. At solar metallicity, we have the, the blue line the mass of the star before, just before the supernova is much, much smaller than the initial mass of the star. It's well below the black line. And now you understand why, because there are stellar winds, and stellar winds are efficient in solar metallicity stars. So the star has lost more than half of its mass during its life. So by the time it enters the core collapse, it has a mass that is around 10, 15-ish solar masses. And then the mass of the compact object, which is the red line, is even lower. This is an upper limit. This arrow shows that this can be much lower than that. So this means that the mass of the compact object is much lower than the final mass of the star. Why? Because in this model, 
the supernova is always successful at solar metallicity because the star loses too much mass during uh, its life by stellar winds. So by the end of its life, its mass is small and then it is going to explode as a supernova, super leaving a small remnant. And then the details depend on the full bed that you assume. Let's go to the zero metallicity. The situation at zero metallicity is completely different. Here we see that the blue line and a black line are overlapped because there are no metal at zero metallicity, it's tautological to say. So basically, the star does not lose mass. The only way it can lose mass is by Thomson scattering, which is highly uh, inefficient. And if the star ends up with uh, this mass, uh, what is the mass of the final remnant of the compact object? Well, in this plot you see basically two regimes. Here, for larger initial masses of the star, you see that the final mass of the compact object is pretty close to the final mass of the star. So the red and the blue line are pretty similar. While here you see that the final mass of the compact object is quite smaller than the final mass of the star. This basically uh, means that there are two regimes, and this is the threshold between them. Above a given initial mass of the star, the final mass is large, and then the star will not undergo a supernova because the gravitational binding energy of the star is too large, so the star will collapse to a black hole completely and the mass of the black hole will be large. While here, the initial mass of the star was not particularly large, so even if the star does not lose mass by stellar means, it's going to explode as a supernova and leave a smaller remnant. Uh, this is probably naive in the sense that we don't expect a sharp threshold between the two regimes, but gives you a fair idea of what's going on here. And now, at the end of the first part of the lecture, we start, the, the initial plot that I show you start making some sense, I hope. So we started from this plot. Oh no, we, actually we started from this plot. But let's, let's go to this one. Uh, we started from this plot, uh, at the beginning of the lecture I told you, okay, if you want to produce black holes as massive as GW150914, uh, we need some model that uh, takes into account the mass, initial mass of the star and the metallicity. Now we can understand this kind of plot, but let's start from here. Okay. So this plot shows the um, final mass of the star before the supernova as a function of the initial mass of the star for nine different metallicities. So this plot is about a model that is very similar to this one. But here you see only solar metallicity and zero metallicity. While here you see intermediate metallicities between, several intermediate metallicities between zero, or more or less zero, and solar. So the question is, what about intermediate metallicity between zero and solar? So what about most stars in the universe? It is way more difficult to discuss intermediate metallicities than to discuss the zero metallicity star, because in the zero metallicity star, you have basically no stellar winds. So you can immediately get to the final results without worrying about stellar evolution. But also the solar metallicity case is kind of easy because solar metallicity is what we can measure nearby. Our sun is solar metallicity. There are many massive stars uh, with, so with approximately solar metallicity. So even if stellar winds are pretty complicated to uh, model and to measure, solar metallicity is the metallicity that we know better in the universe, so we can get models of solar metallicity stars. While for intermediate metallicities, 
we have to rely on the theory of stellar winds, which is fairly complicated, and we have only few measurements to calibrate it with. So the, it is way more difficult to predict what happens at intermediate metallicity. Uh, let's try to discuss this, which is just one of the possible models of stellar winds. Here you see that uh, this is the final mass, pre-supernova mass of a star, as a function of the initial mass of the star for this stellar evolution model. And here you see that there is a pretty monotonic trend with the metallicity. So more metal poor stars have a larger final mass than more, more metal rich ones. Metal rich ones are red, metal poor ones are blue. Okay? So this is pretty monotonic. And what happens if we put on top of these stellar evolution models a model for core collapse supernovae? with all the caveats that we have discussed earlier. It happens something like this. So this seems very similar to this one, but this one is a plot of the final mass of the star as a function of the initial mass of the star for nine stellar metallistic. This is a plot of the final mass of the compact object as a function of the initial mass of the star for the same nine different metallistics. Accounting also, accounting for two things basically, the stellar evolution of the progenitor with stellar winds and the core collapse supernova model with the simplest possible model, the one that depends only on the core mass of the star. So you see that with these uh, two physical ingredients, what just the stellar evolution and the core collapse supernova, what we get is again a monotonic trend with uh, metal-rich stars that produce only smaller black holes and metal-poor stars that can produce both smaller and larger black holes. So, um, one important thing, well, from this plot uh, you can now understand uh, uh, what I said at the beginning, so how can we account for the detection by Lagrangian of the course with mass in excess of 20 solar masses? We can, but if we consider the uh, most updated stellar wind models that produce this trend, and we, if we include the possibility of direct collapse of a star into the black hole, if you do not allow for the direct collapse of a star into a black hole, you cannot get this kind of profile. And now let's go a little bit more into details, like what happens if I change the model of the core collapse supernova? So I told you at the beginning, well not at the beginning, I told you a few slides ago that core collapse supernova is very uncertain and there are many models of core collapse, so how can I know whether this model is crap or there is something that is uh, kind of solid? Even if I change, uh, it's robust. Even if I change the model of core collapse supernova, I still get something like this. So where is my model weak or strong? Well, let's try. Let's try to change the model for core collapse supernova, and let's see what happens to uh, the previous plot. So let's try to quantify the impact of the uncertainties on core collapse supernova models on what we know about the mass of the remnant. So this plot shows the mass of the compact object as a function of the initial mass of the star, again. But here we show only one metallicity of the star, the solar metallicity. So here, different lines mean different metallicity of the star from solar to 100, basically solar. Here, we see the same metallicity and the different colors show different models of core collapse supernova. It is not important uh, what is the physics of this model, so let's just consider them quite different models. The important thing is to look at the plot, so to see what is changing in the plot. And you see that the, uh, for the most massive stars, very little is changing. So even if you change the core collapse supernova model, which is very uncertain, 
what you expect for the most massive stars is reasonably not changing. What changes is down here. So the mass, uh, the final mass of the compact objects born from the lower mass stars is more subject to the uncertainties on core collapse supernova. And you can understand why, basically, because here, in this regime, it is more, more easy to have supernova. So in this regime, the star is so massive that even if you account for stellar winds and whatever, the star is uh, undergoing a weak, if any, supernova, even a solar metallicity. While here, the energetics of the supernova is giving the main uh, input for the final mass of the compact object, whether you will have a neutron star or a black hole and what is the mass of the black hole. So the bottom line is, should we worry about the uncertainties on core collapse supernovae? The answer is yes, but we should worry about core collapse, the uncertainties on core collapse supernovae models, especially for low mass stars and then for low mass compact objects. While we have less problem for very massive stars leading possibly to massive black holes. So for example, one important consequence of this is our knowledge of the minimum black hole mass. So when I show you the plot of the stellar masses in the graveyard, the masses of black holes and neutron stars that have been observed by gravitational wave detections and other uh, uh, electromagnetic experiments, you remember there was a gap between the maximum mass of a neutron star and the minimum mass of a black hole. Uh, is this gap something that is due only to an observational bias or is this gap due to uh, some physical reason? Well, hard to tell. What I can tell you is that depending on the core collapse supernova model that you adopt, you can either enforce this gap or um, have no gap at all. So this plot shows a population of compact objects that were obtained with this kind of models. And in particular, uh, assuming a initial distribution of masses for the stars, and here you see the fraction of compact objects that we get from this population of stars as a function of the mass of the compact objects. And the different lines show different models. These different models differ only by the core collapse supernova model. Okay, so here we are not changing the stellar evolution model. We are not changing other things. We are just changing the core collapse supernova model that we use. And you see that while uh, you see that the mass gap that we may have from observation is between two solar masses, maximum mass of neutron star, and about five solar masses, the smallest black hole that we have possibly observed. And in this gap, two models, the red one and the green one, predict that there is some remnant, while the yellow line predicts no remnant at all. So this is a good thing because uh, core collapse supernovae are uncertain, but if I'm able to constrain the existence of the mass gap from observations, then I can also uh, understand my core collapse supernova better. So I can use, if the observational evidence for a mass gap becomes stronger, now it's just a hint, if it becomes a stronger evidence, then I can use the evidence for a gap between two and five solar masses to uh, reject 
some of the core collapse supernova models that have been proposed in a literature. So this is a very important case where the data can help us understanding the theory better. And yeah, I think I can make these two slides before the break. So we start with the different uh, topics after the break. So uh, there is one more ingredient we have not discussed so far. In, well, at least we have discussed it theoretically, but we have not discussed its impact on the mass of compact objects. So in the previous plots, I have discussed the impact of stellar evolution and core collapse supernovae on the compact objects. What I have not discussed is peristability and pulsational peristability supernovae. But if we have discussed them, it means that they will play a role at some point. Of course, the answer is yes, but to appreciate the importance of peristability and pulsational peristability supernovae, we have to go to larger stellar masses. So, this plot here is very similar to the previous one. So this is the expected mass of the compact object as a function of the initial mass of the progenitor star for several different metallicities. But in the previous plot, uh, the plots stopped basically around here. So 150-ish solar masses. While here in this plot, I go up to 350 solar masses. So these are monsters, these are huge stars. We observe very few of them in the universe. And these predictions for the mass of the compact object were obtained with just the usual ingredients, the evolution of the star and the core collapse supernova. And you see that it seems that even if we go to larger masses, we still have this monotonic trend, very simple. The lower the metallicity, the larger the maximum mass of the black hole. And we even expect black holes with mass of 200 or so solar masses at low metallicity. But, uh, as I said, stellar mass with a helium core larger than about 30 solar masses undergo another kind of supernova, the peristability and the pulsational peristability supernova. So what's their effect? Well, this plot shows what happens if we switch on this additional effect. So here, sorry, here I have only core collapse supernovae and stellar evolution. And core collapse supernovae at some point become really, really inefficient, basically from in this region the core collapse supernova always fail and the black holes collapse, forms by direct collapse. But if we switch on per instability supernova, we get something like this. So you can see many interesting features of difference between this plot and this plot. First of all, you see that there are all ranges of masses where you have no remnants. They depend on the metallicity, so for the larger metallicity there is no gap or a small gap, while for the lower metallicity you see this huge gap here. This is where pair instability occurs. As a, and as I said before, pair instability leads to the complete disruption of the star. The star leaves no remnant. So these are stars that grow a core, helium core, larger than 60 solar masses, and they are completely destroyed by the pair instability supernova. But if you look very carefully here, you see that there is also another, at least one more difference. Let's consider a star with masses of about 100 solar masses here and here. Here you see that for a star of 100 solar masses and a very low metallicity, we predict a black hole with a mass of about 80 solar masses. What happens here? For a star of 100 solar masses, we get a black hole of about 40 something solar masses. So even here, you still have black holes, but the mass is much smaller than here. 
So why? Vesicle D is the mass range where the star develops a core between 30 and 60 solar masses where you enter the pulsation of the instability. So here you enter the pair instability and the star is completely destroyed, no rem. At lower masses, you enter the pulsation of pair instability where the, star, where the star is marginally unstable, oscillates, loses mass, but in the end it survives and it just produces a smaller black hole. And as you can see, this depends strongly on the metallicity, but luckily enough in a way that we can predict. This time is quite, uh, the, the physics is quite sound, is quite robust. And then you can see also these two guys here. So it seems that pair instability does not go uh, to a mass much larger than 230 solar masses. So what happens here? Does it mean that there is a top mass, a maximum mass for pair instability? Yes and no. So, uh, again, it can be shown that if the star develops a helium core mass that is above about 130 solar masses, it undergoes pair instability in the sense that uh, the production of pairs remove pressure and the star collapses. But even uh, if the temperature inside the star rises and nuclear reaction of elements can switch on, the mass of the star is so huge, this gravitational binding energy is so large that nothing can stop the collapse. So basically the result of pair instability for these monster stars is that the star collapses to a black hole completely and it cannot explode. And this may be we have stars with this very large mass in the universe, this may lead to the formation of black holes with mass above 150 solar masses. And I will stop here. This first part was about how do you uh, study the formation of black holes and neutron star with us to physical uh, physics. Um, in the second lecture, we will discuss how do you form binaries of this system. So I think we can enjoy the coffee and reconvene in half an hour. And if you have questions, I will be very happy to answer them.